<laughs> I always start laughing like the minute I start recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Radically Loved Radio. I am so excited to have you guys here. Those of you that are watching the video, hello. Don't mind the appearance or the background. Uh, we are still, Tori and I are still trying to settle in and we're sharing an office now. So there's all kinds of things going on, uh, which, you know, it's life. There's a learning happening at the moment. Uh, but I'm really, really excited to have today's guest on the show for the second time. I've been a big fan of Amy's for a really long time. And Amy Marin is a licensed clinical social worker, college psychology instructor, and a psychotherapist. She's been a regular contributor to Forbes, Inc., Psychology Today, and just so many other publications. Amy's story has been one of um, intense inspiration, uh, especially for me when I first saw her talk on uh, TED. I was just like completely blown away. And I was like, I have to know this incredible, strong woman. Uh, so how do I connect with her? And I did. And I'm so happy that I did. And she's been inspiring me the whole time. She's been busy writing books and articles and just living uh, an incredibly inspiring life. So Amy, welcome. Thanks for having me, Rosie. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to have you. So I think that, you know, you what your latest book uh 13 things mentally strong women don't do is uh was an incredible i've read it twice and it's got the doggy ears in all the pages and i think that it's something that we are in a state in our lives right now as women where we need to be able to call some of these things that block us out and to be able to um, really get into the state of being confident and feeling confident. And I think that this book really uh, did an incredible job at showcasing that and giving us tools and showing us different ways that we, uh, that we can change the way that we normally do things. Right. Right. That's what I was hoping to do. A lot of people said, well, why did you write a book, you know, specifically for women? And I just wanted to make it clear, you know, as women, sometimes we face different challenges than men do. Because people say, well, don't, doesn't everybody build mental strength the same? Like, yes, it's a lot of the same strategies. But on the other hand, you know, women deal with some certain issues that men, I think, just can't relate to. And we're raised a little bit differently and we uh, experience different pressures, those sorts of things. So I wanted to talk about what are some of the bad habits that as women we tend to fall into and then how do you give those up? Yeah. Well, and in your findings, like when you were doing this research, obviously, like with your background, you, you've worked with a lot of women that have had these same struggles. I think for you, what was the main catalyst that inspired you to do this specifically for women? Like, was there something that happened or was it something that was always at the forefront of your mind? Well, you know, after my first book came out, um, the mentally, what mentally strong people don't do, I started getting so many questions from women specifically saying, well, what does it look like to be a mentally strong woman? How do we raise strong daughters? Those sorts of questions. And you know, I really started thinking about it. I thought, oh, so many of the examples of toughness that we have out there are Navy SEALs or it's elite athletes. And so often it's men. And in looking back, I thought, you know, in my first book, a lot of the examples I talked about too are men. And so I thought, you know, what do we need to, what do we need to just start the discussion about what does it look like to be a strong woman and that a strong woman isn't necessarily mean. She's not the B word. She's, she's somebody who can be nurturing and caring and you don't necessarily have to treat your body like a machine as if you were a Navy SEAL, but how do you have a healthy body image? How do you go through some of life's biggest obstacles? How do you deal with certain things like, you know, the Me Too movement as a woman? Yeah. Uh, and all of that, you know, Me Too sort of unfolded after we started writing the book. And so as I was working on it and talking to my publisher and my editor, and uh, then Me Too movement really kicked it into high gear, which opened up even more doors and opportunities to start talking about uh, some of the specific issues that women are facing. Yeah, and I, I, I think that that's been the biggest uh, takeaway that I got from this, um, you know, this idea of like the positive affirmation that's coming from 
utilizing our vo voice in a very uh, authentic and strong and confident way. Um, after we've been conditioned for so long to not say anything and to not speak up and to not say what we're um, going through because we, we don't want to seem a certain way or seem as like weak or like we're uh, being victims or whatever it may be, you know, for people out there that maybe have that, that type of mentality. Um, how did it, how, what's been the response in the light of the Me Too movement with, you know, something like this book? It's been really positive and it's opened up a lot of doors to speak to men about it too, because I've had a lot of men say, well, I deal with all of those same struggles. So I don't understand why this book is specifically for women. And it's given me the opportunity to provide some education about some of the things that women experience, you know, until you've been cat called, you don't know what that really feels like. And I'm yet to find a man that says, yeah, I walk down the street and, you know, women are yelling inappropriate comments at me, but I, you know, most of us women have had that happen to us and those sorts of things are, you know, what it's like to, to, uh, to be a woman, you know, one of the, I guess, the studies that really sticks out to me is uh, the conversation about when they ask little kids and they ask five-year-olds uh, to pick out who's a brilliant person and they show them pictures of men and women. And all the little girls, almost all of them pick out a woman. They point to a woman and almost all the little boys point to a man. And then they ask those same kids when they're seven years old, pick out somebody who looks brilliant. And almost all of the little girls start picking out men and so did the little boys. So you think, well, what happens between the ages of five and seven? Will kids start going to school? And who do we give them as examples of brilliant astronauts and engineers and scientists? It's almost all men. And so you think something has to change. And so I just writing this book specifically for women has given me those opportunities to explain, yeah, it's not just that you know, women are, are complaining. We're not whiners. It's not that we are just coming out and just saying we're victims. I'm saying this is what's happening. This is the, the world that we still live in today. And this is what women are facing. And this is how we can all work together to change that. Yeah, I think that that's been really huge uh, for me as well, just to see the level of strength that we can gain from having more women rise up to that power and to feel that sense of confidence and that self sense of self importance to be able to say like, my opinion matters. I am totally capable of doing the same thing that our male counterparts can do. And I am strong enough to voice my opinion and to say no when I don't want to do something or to say yes when I do want to do something. Um, I think is, is really huge. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. You're talking about like this idea of educating men as well to understand where we're coming from. And, and I do like the, the example that you used, you know, like a woman can walk down the street and get cat called and feel like she's being like violated in a sense, or this feeling of, of being like, diminished to just the her physicality um what has been the reception for men that you've spoken to about this like what is their feeling how are they taking this movement of women uh getting getting more uh, open and honest about how they feel you know in that disparity between men and women you know, it's a variety of responses. I've had some men who have been very open to saying, you know, I want to learn more. I want to know, how do I raise a strong daughter? I want to read this book so that I can figure out what it's like for for my partner, for my, for my daughters growing up in this world. And I've had uh, other men who uh, just still kind of want to talk about the fact that, you know, how tough it is to be a man in today's world. And so it's given me just, you know, a unique opportunity, I think, to say, uh, and also here's what women are dealing with. And for me, that's, it's been one of the best parts about writing this book and to give women an opportunity to, uh, who read the book, the opportunity to have something to talk about with men too, to open the door and say, Hey, I was reading this, or here's some of the pressures that women are dealing with, whether it's how we look, or you look at women's magazines compared to what they put in men's magazines and so much pressure on us to look good and pretend like it's easy. And uh, so much effort going into, uh, you know, what does it look like to be a leader 
when they ask people that, draw a picture of what it looks like to be a leader. Almost everybody draws a man, including women. So just learning more about ourselves and recognizing some of the stereotypes that we hold and how, how to change that. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, how, how do we begin to just change that in our everyday, especially for the parents out there who have daughters? You know, how, how in their household can they begin to change the dynamic of that? I think the biggest thing is to just expose both boys and girls to strong women, introduce them to to women who are doing awesome things. Or you see a woman who's in a non-traditional gender role, by all means, introduce them to your kids. Show your kids that there are female scientists or female astronauts. And you have to be more proactive about it because most of the examples, the things you'll see on the news, a lot of things you'll read in the history books are going to be men. So sometimes you have to purposely seek out positive examples. But by doing that, it just really teaches kids, okay, it's not just that I'm telling you, you can be anything you want, but I'm showing you as well that girls can grow up and and do all of these things that that men are doing as well. Because so often I think we give kids that message, no, you can do anything you want. And then we show them all of these examples that tend to be men. So just by exposing kids to, to strong women and having more open conversations about the some of the barriers that women face but also then how do you overcome those barriers and how do you uh, work through the hurdles that you might face yeah and i i also like the idea of um creating uh powerful female groups or connecting with more powerful women um to to continue to up level that support to just feel the the energy that'll come from connecting with other uh strong women you know, what do you think about doing that? Absolutely. You know, I mean, from studies and once you once you see this, you can't unsee it. The fact that when you put women and men in a group together, a business meeting, men dominate the meeting nine times out of 10. I mean, something like 75% more airtime that men get in speaking. And so wow. sometimes people will say, well, women are just more efficient with their words. But studies say that's not necessarily true. It's that women don't speak up as much. But if you uh, put a group of women together. I mean, the ideas are flowing and things are happening, but you put a couple of men in the group and it really changes the dynamic. So I think for women to, A, just be more aware of that and to know, okay, we're just as deserving as airtime and it's okay to speak up. And for women leaders to go ahead and call on other women, but also for women to work together that we're not you know, fighting and clawing our way up the ladder and pushing each other down, but instead we can all lift each other up and work together. Yeah, like where does that di- where did that dynamic come in? Where there there there's so much of that tearing down, like competitiveness. Uh, I mean, I guess it's any with anything, right? But but mm-hmm. I feel like for women too, it's almost like we've taken taken on that that masculine. I mean, whether it's masculine or feminine, I don't know. You'd be a better judge to say, but but that idea of like feeling the competition or their, that lack mentality where I can't uplift another woman because then that means there's less for me or the competitive nature that is just having a career when you're in an environment where that's, you know, the, the, there's only a position for one person to quote unquote win. Um, do you think that that plays a role in all in our ability to find other powerful people in, in our, like tribes or environment? It does. You know, I think when we see a, a, a business meeting and we know, all right, there's one spot for one woman to be a leader, you know, one out of 10 women are a leader. Then we think, okay, it's really limited. And women only have this, this one opportunity. And so rather than help people out, we think there are competitors. We look at other women and think that they're somehow in direct competition. And if they win that spot, then there's no room for us. And it's that sort of mentality, I think, that gets us to tear each other down. And we think if I just put somebody else down, I, I somehow climb this social hierarchy a little bit more. And, you know, you see it all the time. And it's not just in the workspace. You see it on social media. You see it in, in female friendships. But uh, that it's just tempting sometimes, I think, to, to put people down, to think, okay, if I can just somehow push them down a little more, somehow I'll rise up. But you know, nobody ever looks better by putting other people down. But you have to, you have to really take a, a closer look at that. Like, what areas of your life are you the person who speaks ill of her friends? Do you talk negatively about your coworkers, or do you want to be the person who lifts other people up? Yeah, well, and I love that because I want to segue into um, negativity. You talk about that, and you, you know, you give uh, some really great 
uh, tips on how to like steer away from that negative, that negativity, right? Or those thought patterns. Um, and I know in your first book, like I really loved how you spoke to uh, all the ways that we, we knock our, ourselves down, you know, from becoming strong. And so thinking of that, like as women, when we have a negative thought pattern that comes up and maybe the negative thought pattern is, I don't want to speak up at this meeting because uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to seem like, you know, um, too, you know, abrupt, abrupt or too pushy or too masculine or too whatever, you know? Um, what is some advice that you can give for the people that are listening to this women in, in particular that are in the workforce that are in a position of power, but don't want to take that next step to voice what they want because they don't want to seem weak or too needy or too, um, I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. You know, I think anytime you're questioning, Jay, should I do this or not? Or you, there's something you want to do, but you hesitate because fear is holding you back or you're afraid that you might get rejected or embarrassed. Uh, one of the most helpful things is argue the opposite. Say, okay, well, what if I did this? And it can just help you develop a more balanced view. So we make our best decisions in life when we balance our emotions with our logic. And when your emotions are high, your logic goes down. So when you're fearful, you'll think of all the reasons why you shouldn't do something. So just by arguing the opposite, write down a list of all the reasons why you should do it. And then you might also write down the pros and cons of not doing it. And just seeing it on paper raises your logic and it can help you take that brave step. And another good one is to just say, what would I say to a, a trusted friend? We tend to give other people advice so much more easily than we give it to ourselves. It just rolls off our tongue. Hey, you know what you should do? And we have these encouraging, kind words. But when it comes to the way that we speak to ourselves, we tend to think, oh, you idiot, you can't do this. You're never going to succeed. You're going to fail. You'll embarrass yourself. And we call ourselves names. And it's this cycle that's hard to break. But if you just say, well, wait a minute. My friend came to me and said, hey, I'm struggling with this issue. What would I say back? And then give yourself that same advice. Yeah. Again, it helps you see things more logical. It can help you say, okay, how do I, how do I take that next step? And finally, you just got to sometimes just uh, act as if, act as if you felt confident. Even if you aren't feeling it, just go through the motions. And when you change your behavior first, often the emotions follow. And then you can start to see yourself as a more confident, capable person. But you have to take that bold step by doing it first. Yeah. Like how, how does somebody do that, that bold step? Like if you had to draw it out, like, does that mean they have to stand a certain way or walk a certain way or change the, the way that they dress or the route that they're taking to work or whatever? Like, what do you think is an actionable step to the act as if, cause I love that. That's like one of the best, that's I I get to do that a lot, you know, especially when I'm feeling a little bit insecure about something. I'm like, okay, just go in there and just pretend like you're really confident, you know? Right, right. So you, I think just asking yourself that, what would a confident person do? Or what would a mentally strong person do? And it might be, I'm going to look people in the eye. I'm going to shake their hand. I'm going to be friendly. I'm going to be more outgoing than I feel like I could be. And, and, and I'm just going to do that. Maybe it is about the way that you dress. Maybe it's saying, okay. And it's not about saying, I'm going to wear a Rolex, even though I can't afford it and saying, I'm going to be fake, but it's more about saying, I'm going to bring out the best side of me. So it might be putting on a, a polished outfit. And if you feel like you uh, are more confident in high heels, by all means, you wear those. But if you're somebody who says, you know, I'm going to wear my Converse sneakers, because that's what makes me feel confident, then you go ahead and do that too. Whatever it is that, that helps you say, okay, how do I, how do I, uh, look and act like a stronger, more confident woman. And then once you behave like the person you want to become, it actually starts to happen after a while. Yeah. How important do you think it is for women to speak authentically? It's really important. I think that's, you know, we've been silenced for so long and it's hard to, to speak up or we worry about what people are going to think. And it just perpetuates these ideas about what you know that women are meek and mild and that we're supposed to be quiet or that women are overly emotional so then we stifle all of our emotions even though you know it's a strange dynamic we tell little girls it's okay to cry but then when you're 30 years old if you were to shed a tear at work we think oh she's crazy she's overly emotional all of these mixed messages so i think as long as 
we can all just start to speak up and know that it's okay and you don't have to please everyone and people may think you're, you're kind of crazy or that you're overly bold whatever it is but that it's okay as long as you're true to yourself at the end of the day not everybody has to like you but as long as you like you you can still go to sleep and knowing that all right i did my best today and um and i'm okay with that yeah do you think that by speaking your authentic truth it creates a deeper level of self-love absolutely i think uh you know for all of us when we try to put on a, a polished face all the time and we think we have to smile and be nice and say everything's great you know there's a part of us that just knows this isn't this isn't me this isn't what's really going on i'm not being honest and when you feel like that uh, it's hard to it's hard to love yourself but when you can say hey this is through me for most of us, then you find out who your real friends are, for one. And then, you, I mean, more times than not, when you tell your story, people say, ah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And as a therapist, I mean, my door all day long was filled with people who were coming in and saying, you know, here's my problem, but I feel like nobody else knows what I'm talking about. If they only knew, I just spoke to 10 other people on the same day who had the exact same feeling. Oh, yeah. And yet, you know, but it's easier said than done. I mean, even as a therapist for me, when I came out with this book, everybody said, oh, you wrote this because you are an expert and you knew all this stuff. I had to come out later and say, actually, I wrote this because I struggle with all of these things. And that was tough to do. And even as somebody who's always talking about the fact that, you know, you should be honest and authentic, uh, again, easier said, easier said to, to do for other people, but much harder to do for ourselves. Yeah. And I, I love what you said. You said that earlier when you were talking about giving the friend advice, it's like somebody asks you for advice and you're just like, here's what needs to happen. You need to do that. Like we can give our friends like all this really prolific, incredibly deep advice. But then when it comes to ourselves, we can sometimes stifle that or we feel like it wouldn't work or it's not maybe good enough or whatever it may be. So I, I really like I really like what you're saying about that because it, it does give, there is a different energy that the truth carries, right? Yes. And I feel like we recognize truth when it's the truth. And I feel like that just, it coincides with this idea of uh, authentically speaking who and what you truly are, because I feel like the soul recognizes that. And that's why I feel that we resonate with people that are truth tellers because we feel, oh, this person's actually being completely honest. They're not putting on a front. They're being who they are. And that's inspiring, you know, as opposed to somebody who has a veneer on and has the lights and they're doing the thing. And it's, you know, this polished way of being confident that, that I think we can recognize as, as it, it's like not real, right? Yes, I think most of us are attracted to people who can say, oh, listen to what happened to me today. And they have a story about, you know, they fell down, they embarrassed themselves in front of people. And like, yeah, I can relate to that versus somebody who just, you know, only talks about all the good stuff, denies that they go through painful human emotions or they just can't talk about their mistakes. Yeah. So we're drawn to people who can admit, yeah, I'm human too. And here's what, here's what I've done. And it gives us permission then to say, you know, I can relate to that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. What are three things if you could tell every single five-year-old girl on the planet, what are three th that will stay with them? What are three things that you would tell them? I would say you're stronger than you think. Uh, don't ever let anyone else limit your potential. And... you're more capable than you give yourself credit for. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> okay, here's the next question. What would your 95 year old self tell us all, all the women right now, including yourself, what would she, what's three things that she would tell us now? I care less about what people think. <laughs> live bold and get out there and just do things and be kinder to people that you meet because you don't know what sort of struggles they're facing as well. Hmm. I love that. Always so wise. It doesn't matter where you go, Amy. It's so amazing. Thank you. Um, 
Wow. I mean, I can obviously talk to you forever. Definitely. Uh, I definitely can. And I would love to, uh, but for the people that are listening, that are watching, where can they go to connect with you or for more information? My website's probably the best place, which is Amy Morin, LCSW is in licensed clinical social worker.com. Okay. That's great. And uh, for the people that are listening to this or watching this, all of those links will be on uh, the info button if you're listening to the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you go to the bottom info section, those links will be there as well as a link to buy Amy's books because she's got several. She's also got 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do, which I was just talking to her about before that I'm a big fan and I've not read that one yet. I'm not a parent because part of me is like, I'm not a parent yet. Maybe I'll just hold on to it back there in the bookshelf until it's time. But I did send it to uh, a couple of my family members because it's in Spanish and it's so amazing. I'm so excited and they love it. Okay. Anyway, so please, yes, follow up and let us know what you thought about this podcast. But before I let you go, Amy, I have one final question and I've asked it before. Uh, and I don't know that you remember what the answer was and I'm curious if it's the same, but I created this podcast as a way and a place for people to come to, to get information or to feel supported. The idea is that we are all radically loved by God's source, whatever higher power, whatever you believe in that the universe works for us and not against us. So the question to you is how do you feel radically loved? Um, I guess I feel radically loved by by the, the people that I meet that just genuinely inspire me to be a better person. When I come across those people, I definitely feel radically loved. Thank you, Amy. I love that. Thank you so much for being a part of our little community and for being on again. We look forward to seeing how many more books you write to continue to educate us on these topics. Thank you so much for your courage and your voice and your wisdom. I hope that you come back on. Well, thanks for having me again, Rosie. Oh, shoot. Amy? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Are you still I'm there? Still, oh, my God. I'm uh, like, I'm oh still no. here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. No, we, I hit the end. I hope that it didn't.